All right, Bible 10, here's what we got on tap for today. Um, it's our Wednesday before Easter break, so congratulations. We've almost made it to like a real break where you can do whatever you want at home, um, provided that it's good and wholesome and God-honoring um, for a whole week. So um, this is our last Bible lesson before we take a break for a week. So um, here's our lesson plan for the 8th. You're going to start with that warm-up. Hopefully you've done it. In your opinion, what's the difference between a true disciple of Jesus and a false disciple? Um, and then you're going to watch this. And then there's a couple of other assignments, just two more assignments after that warm-up today, just uh, annotating Matthew chapter 7 and the exit ticket. And so let's go ahead and dive into, um, hopefully you'll find um, the entrance and exit tickets um, in the warm-up section. Yep. Um, there's the warm-up and then the exit ticket here um, on the home tab. The annotate is, should be in the homework classwork section, um, and you should be able to find it um, in the assignments tab. Um, that's going to be where your go-to place for that one. Um, so let's do this thing. So uh, the reason I wanted to start off is if you've read Matthew chapter 7 before, you know that he does a lot of like true and false types of people. And so I wanted you to start just like checking yourself. Like what, what does it mean for someone to be a true disciple of Jesus and a false disciple of Jesus? Someone who really follows him um, and someone who doesn't. Who, someone who's like a real Christian or like the fake kind that just uses the name. Um, and then after that, um, in order to make sure that everything else that we talk about today is, I guess, um, fresh in your brain, um, I want you to do a one last annotation assignment. I promise this isn't going to be the rest of the semester you're annotating every last thing, um, but I want you to do one last catch um, annotation where, again, you circle and define words you don't know, you acknowledge confusion, you talk to the text, like interact with it a little back and forth, you capture the main assertion and um, idea, um, by like each section. Some of you are doing a really good job of this. Some of you like just um, sum up like just a couple of lines, but like when, whenever you notice there's like a natural break in thought, um, I want you to sum up the idea there and then highlight anything that stands out to you as important or thought provoking. Um, and so that's what you're doing. The assignment is called Annotate Matthew Chapter 7 um, and um, do it in Notability or you might even be able to do it directly in Canvas. I'm not sure what the highlighting features are like there, but make sure you submit it back to the assignment. Cool. Um, so pause and do that right now. Go. Um, so after uh, last time we we left off, Matthew was recording when Jesus talks about um, judgment and pearls and how both of those are are methods of controlling people. And if we think from the beginning of the sermon, it's all one solid flow. Really, um, it starts with a declaration that even if you are the typically unblessed people of society, good for you. Blessed are you because the kingdom of God is available to you. And not only that, not only is the kingdom available to you, but you are the salt and the light. It's you that gets to make this world taste good. It's you that gets to have this world be preserved from rottenness. It's you that gets to have this world be a, a source of, you get to be a source of healing in this world. You get to be a source of guidance toward the Father. Um, you are the salt and the light. Um, and the way we do that is by really properly interpreting what the Jewish law is about. This is why Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And to fulfill it means to interpret it properly. So this is what God was after when he started the law. And so uh, he then goes into saying all of those, you've heard it said, but I say. And after that, um, he shows that it's all about the internal condition. It's not about murder. It's about hatred. It's not about adultery, it's about lust. It's not about filling out the right paperwork, but it's about holding to your commitments. It's not about um, holding your promises if they're a specific type, but about being an honest person in all circumstances. It's not about getting equal vengeance or loving the right type of people, but um, being a creative restorative force that loves everybody in the world. And not only that, but then in Matthew 6, we take that turn, and it's not just about transforming your external sin life, um, to becoming an internal thing, but it's about transforming your internal reality so that even your prayer looks different, even your giving to the poor, even um, the way that you fast and practice spiritual different uh, uh, disciplines looks different because in those contexts, you are um, 
you're really concerned about the heart space, about where you connect with God and doing it authentically and not about being a show for other people. And so if that's the case and you're connecting with God and that heart is restored, then you become this non-anxious presence in the world that's not pursuing money or wealth or financial security, but you're the type of person who's pursuing the kingdom, which is what God wants in this world, which probably includes you being clothed and you getting to eat. Um, now, after that, if you're a non-anxious presence in the world, then you're not going to be anxious about controlling other people either. So you're not going to judge them and you're not going to try to control them by throwing pearls at their face, even if they don't want them. And so naturally after this, he, he then moves into. So you notice that this is a one big narrative flow. It's not a bunch of disjointed segments of a sermon, but it's all one big idea for three chapters. And this is where he goes after it. In Matthew chapter 7, um, he says, ask, seek, and knock. Um, everyone who asks is answered. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open to them. And I think that this is really important. I think it's been true universally of people, but especially those of us who like to feel like we have it all together. Um, like, imagine you have some sort of favor that you need to take care of, and you call a friend late at night. Your first, your first impulse oftentimes is the first words out of your mouth is, I'm so sorry, but, right? Instead of being comfortable with acknowledging the fact that we need to be dependent on and reliant on other people, um, our first impulse is to be like, I should be able to do this on my own. I'm so sorry to bother you. Um, now, if you don't have that impulse, you might be kind of rude um, because I understand that part of why we say this kind of stuff is to like, show that we're be trying to be considerate and don't want to take advantage of people. But I think that it also, on the other side of it, reveals that there's an expectation in our society that we should be able to take care of ourselves, that we shouldn't have to need other people. And I think Jesus, in this next step, after saying, yeah, you're in a non-anxious presence that doesn't control other people, but then he's like, but we still need, right? We still have dependency. We still have to lean on someone. Um, and so that's why he says, hey, guess what? When your heavenly father hears you ask for things, if you ask for bread, why is he going to give you a stone? Um, in the Luke version of this, it says, like, if, if you ask for a, an egg, why would he give you a scorpion? Um, and I, I think that what, what Jesus is talking about here is, is a couple of things. One, we need to be comfortable with relying on and needing God. Because when, when he originally created the universe, he made it in such a way that we were to have a relationship with him. And it's through that relationship that, that we learn what it's like to be human and how to properly live. But then the other thing is, is relying on his understanding and knowledge, because there are times where we think we're asking for one thing and we think it's the right thing to ask for, but then God actually knows better. This is why he compares it to a father. Like if, if my daughter, Seji, um, asked for a scorpion, I would not give her a scorpion, no matter how much she like kicked and screamed and said how badly she wanted it. Um, I'm not going to give her a scorpion because I know that's what's best for her. And so in the same way, like I think Jesus, by doing that, who's going to give you a rock if you want, if you need bread, I think he's pointing at this reality that like, hey, even if you think you want a stone, even if you think you want a snake, like God's going to provide for you in a way, giving you what you do actually need, right? And so don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to seek. Don't be afraid to knock, especially with your heavenly father. And then he, he wraps it up because this is the thing that lets me know that it's probably not just talking about our Heavenly Father, that this asking and seeking and knocking, but it's probably also interrelational is that right after it, he goes into this thing that has been famously called the golden rule, which, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, sometimes people get this thing distorted and they're like, cool, so however people treat me, I need to treat them. False. That's not what Jesus is saying. Let's read it again one more time really carefully. Whatever you wish or whatever you want that others would do to you, do also to them. Treat other people the way that you yourself want to be treated. And then he says, for this is the law and the prophets. And remember, the law is not like some governmental code that ends you in jail, but, but the Jewish law, the Torah, and the prophets. In other words, Jesus says the whole Old Testament, the whole Bible to the people of that day can be summarized in this. Treat others how you would like to be treated. 
That's the golden rule. If you practice this, you find that, hey, maybe you wouldn't be so hateful. Um, maybe if like you, like the things that we talked about last time with the lust stuff, if you think about it, like, do you want your, like, do you want your future spouse to be lusted after by a bunch of people? Do you want other people um, lusting after your, your husband or wife? Well then, hey, then why would you lust after someone else's husband or wife? Um, do you want other people to be dishonest with you? Then cool, be honest with other people. Um, do you want other people to be, to be hateful towards you and call you names that hurt your feelings? Well, then why would you do that to other people? This is all, I think Jesus is on to something by saying, hey, the whole law and prophets can be summed up by this. And then he says, um, he starts talking about this narrow path. And he says, narrow or, or narrow is the path that leads to life, but broad is the road that leads to destruction. And what I don't think Jesus is doing here is saying like, okay, look, I've made a big gate, right? I've made a big gate to go over here to destruction, and I've made a little tiny road that goes off to the side to go to life. But rather, I think that what Jesus is saying here um, is that uh, it, I think it's best summed up when we're talking about why is the path to life narrow, it's best summed up by looking at this. Uh, this is the... Interstate 605 and the 10 interchange. Um, it happens. I think it's Covina. Maybe it's maybe it's El Monte. I don't know. But if you're taking the if you're taking the 605, um, then you'll notice that when you are trying to get onto one of the freeways, um, they um, even in this picture right here, like this is the new on ramp because they realized how terrible the design was. Um, when you're trying to to merge with a different freeway. Um, what they have you do is, let's see, let's follow this one. If you're getting off the 605, trying to get onto the 10, you notice that up here, the 10 also has an exit like that. And you actually have to like, so you're on the 10 and these people are on the 605 and you want to get over here and they want to get over here. So instead of building separate on-ramps, they probably saved money by making it one on-ramp where two lanes or three lanes of traffic have to do this, where they have to flip-flop. And if you can't find an opening in merging, then you get back on the same freeway that you were trying that you were on before. I think that this is what Jesus is saying when he says that the the path to destruction is broad. If you do not take any intentional action, if you do not actively choose to get onto the road of life, you will go to the path of destruction. That's just what's going to happen. Like it's not that he's like, "Hey, I made this big road." Um, and I want to make sure people go to destruction, but rather if you don't wake up and repent, if you don't wake up and realize that you need to get out of this lane, then you will go to the path of destruction. This is why the path of life is narrow and the path of destruction is wide. It's like if you're on the 605, wide is the path to get back on the 605, but narrow is the path to the 10. And I think Jesus is showing us like, hey, if you don't take intentional action, you'll end up in destruction. Like you don't merge automatically. You have to make a choice to actually merge and change. And then he goes into prophets and disciples and like kind of shows this illustration. And he's like, yeah, there's, there's false and there's true prophets, but the way that you know the difference between the two is their fruit. Um, in other sections of scripture, false prophets are called wolves in sheep's clothing. I don't know if you see this in the image here, um, but wolves in sheep's clothing. Like there are people who like claim to be prophets and speak on behalf of God. But hey, if you want to know they're a true prophet, what you do is you check their fruit because apple trees don't make oranges. So if you're not sure what type of tree it is, look at the fruit. Look at what they produce. Look at what their life generates. Does their life generate um, the kingdom of God? Or does their life generate something else? And this is probably the way that you tell, is it a true or a false prophet? Um, and then last, his last um, true or false thing that he talks about is the true and false disciples. And if we read in Matthew chapter 7, um, let's see, I think it's probably best um, that we, we pull this up in Scripture. Um, because... I think sometimes we assume it's one thing when it's actually another. And he says here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Cool, that's a good start. So those who do the will of his Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. And this is the line that we really need to pay attention to, right? Because notice that even these people in verse 22 that are saying, uh, we prophesied in your name, we drove out demons, we did miracles. Did they do works for God? Did they do things that Jesus wants that would typically happen in the kingdom? Of course, yeah. People, demons being driven out and miracles happening and like prophesying in the name of Jesus. Yeah, like that's good stuff. But Jesus, when he says, you are not a true disciple, What's his line? Is it that you didn't do a good, enough good stuff? Is it that you failed to know your theology properly? No, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. Even though they didn't do evil, they did good. He says, I never knew you. You want to know the difference between a true and a false disciple? If they know God. Um, knowing God is not like knowing about God. In fact, in, in Spanish, here, let's just add this here onto the slide. In Spanish, um, they're really good at specifying this. There's one verb, um, which is saber, which is to know. Um, and this is like, you know, two plus two equals four, right? That's that kind of know. But then there's another Spanish verb, which is conocer, which also means to know. But this is like, um, I know my friends. Like, I know my friends. When I say I know my friends, I'm not saying I have information about my friends, but there's a relational connection between me and my friends. So the difference between a false disciple and a true disciple, the thing that makes the false disciples false is not their actions, it's not their behavior, it's not what they say with their mouths because the, the false disciples prophesied in the name of Jesus. But rather, like, you can saber, you can know that Jesus is Lord. Well, good for you. The demons know that Jesus is Lord. So what sets you apart from the demons? The difference would be if you're a true disciple that you know God, like you know your friends, that there's a relational connection, there, that there's trust, that there's connection between you and God. This is what makes you a true disciple, is if you know God. And so I think this would be a good gut check for you guys right now, is maybe you consider yourself like you've called yourself a Christian your whole life because you've gone to a Christian school or your family is Christian and you know things about God. But my question would be, do you know God? Have you said, God, I want, I want to be your friend. I want to be your child. I want to have a relationship with you. Have you opened yourself up to that? If not, I would, I would recommend, like, dude, give that a shot. Like, open yourself up to him and see what it's like to be known by God and to know God. And then last, he ends with this um, metaphor. He says that there's two people, um, a wise man and a foolish man, and they build their houses. One man builds his house on a rock. Another man builds his house on sand. Um, and the wind blows and beats against both of these houses. But one of these houses stand and one of them doesn't. Clearly, the house on the rock stands. But what is the house on the rock? Read the text carefully. Because sometimes we sing these songs in chapel and it's like, hey, Jesus is my rock, which is totally true. But notice that when Jesus teaches this, he's not saying, I am the rock, build your house on me. But rather, like read it, he says, those that hear these words of mine and put them into practice, they are like a wise person. And those who hear these words of mine and, put, and do not put them into practice, they're the foolish ones. The difference between wise and foolish is not knowing the right answer, but it's acting on the knowledge about the right answer. You can have Matthew 5 through 7 memorized, but then not live it out, not trust it and, and dial your life into um, following that model that Jesus gives us. And so the, the last thing that you guys got going here is an exit ticket, and this exit ticket asks you to interact with that text. What distinguishes between a wise or a foolish builder? And make sure that you don't just have like a patent answer like build your life on god like what does that mean and what did jesus actually say and then two is more of a personal reflective piece this isn't a discussion so it'll your answers just go to me in your honest opinion do you think you are a wise or a foolish builder and why 
So make sure that you honestly answer that question, and I would challenge you guys as you go into Easter break to have this question be at the front of your mind as you think about Good Friday, as you think about Easter. Like, is God um, is actually applying his words and taking them seriously and doing something about them, the foundation of your life? Or is it something else? Um, when you think about his death and resurrection over this weekend, um, let the words of Jesus sink into your soul. Bye, guys. I'll see you in a week.